you know, postmodernism at its base, at its core, has some important, uh, important observations. You know, the the idea that um, we can change some things about our reality with social influence, but at the point that it becomes overgeneralized, uh, it becomes, frankly, a potential weapon. Heather Hying, an evolutionary biologist, author of Hunter Gatherer's Guide to the 21st Century, which I will leave a link to in the description below, with co author Brett Weinstein, former guest of the show and the host of one of my favorite podcasts, the Dark Horse Podcast. Heather, welcome to the Freedom Pack Podcast. I am thrilled to be here. Thank you for having me, Lewis. So we'll start with the book. Amazing. I read through it, thoroughly enjoyed it. I'd love to start this interview off at the end. The book ends with the problem is evolutionary, so is the solution. I wonder if you could just expand on that to our audience and what you meant by that. Yeah, well, um, as I'm going to take it back to the beginning for a moment first uh, and just say that the title of the book, A Hunter-Gatherer's Guide to the 21st Century, alludes both to this sort of this period in our evolution that everyone has in their head of the sort of Paleolithic era of hunter-gatherers in the African savanna. And certainly that is part of our history, but also agriculture is, our, is part of our history and industrialization is part of our history and going farther back or in the other direction back in time, uh, being primates and being mammals and being fish and being animals, all, all of these things are part of our history. So uh, the book attempts to well, understand our environment of evolutionary adaptedness, not just from the perspective of the hunter-gatherer, but from all of those points in time, and to find the truth and relevance of our history, both deep and not, and use that to understand how we can move forward with both you know, new things, new progress, things that we've never imagined before, and, uh, and also a respect for those parts of our history that we would like to, be, to bring into the future. Uh, and, you know, and also a recognition of those parts of our past that uh, we have no choice about. You know, things, things like the fact that we are a sexually reproducing species, that's, that's not going to change. So um, the, the problem, the problems of modernity that we have produced are evolutionary because we are in fact evolutionary and we can use the toolkit that Brett and I uh, introduce and, um, you know, in large part, it, we are we are bringing together the the thinking of the of the people who have, have come before us in the book, and then we have also introduced a number of new ways of of going about an evolutionary framework. So, how can we understand the problems of modernity with an evolutionary toolkit? How can we escape from some of the pitfalls that seem to be at risk of dragging us down, also with an evolutionary toolkit? You mentioned in the book that there are. Uh various names you could have settled on for the title of this book. Why did you settle on Hunter Gatherer? Yeah, I think it's um, because it's the one that people have in their heads when, you know, most people, when you say human evolution, you know, what, what did humans used to look like? Mm. Most people don't think of that early primate in the trees, you know, eating, eating fruit. Most people don't think of a Dickensian, uh, you know, Victorian era, human, you know, 150 years ago, even though both of those things are part of our history as well. Uh, so the image that people will tend to have and, um, and romanticize again, is that of the Savannah living hunter gatherer. And it's, it's accurate, but it's only accurate in so far as it is a piece of our history and, and only one. So yeah, exactly as, as we say in the book, and as I alluded to in what I said earlier, we could have called it an agriculturalist's guide to the 21st century, a fish's guide to the 21st century. Uh, those would be equally accurate, but you know, the deeper in history we go, the more fundamental the truths are that we've inherited from those ancestors. You know, we have bone um, because our fishy ancestors evolved bone, and we have airplanes because our post-industrialist ancestors invented airplanes. And both of those are evolutionary innovations uh, from you know, very different moments in our history. You mentioned this right at the top of the book, but I'd love you to explain to our audience before we dive into it, what do you mean by that we live in a hyper novel world? Mm. 
Yeah, so that's that's the term that we're using, that Brett and I are using in the book and, and in our lives and have been for many years now to describe the rate of change that we are creating, that humans are creating in our world now. And so we, we say in the book that uh, you know, every organism, it is, it is sort of a truism in evolution and ecology and the study of, of life on earth, that every organism has a niche. And uh, it is then a question that you might ask, what is the human niche? And the answer that we arrive at is that the human niche is in fact niche switching, that we are more plastic, more capable of moving between domains than any other organism on the planet. And of course, other organisms, um, especially those who are also long lived and social and have generational overlap and long childhoods and, you know, sort of all the usual suspects that you might imagine, elephants and wolves and orcas and other primates and such and more parrots. Um, also have some ability to be generalists, but we are, we are by far most expert in that. And so if the human niche is, is niche switching, then what we do is, is we move between things very, very well. But since, you know, depending on when you count, you know, maybe you want to start with 2013 even uh, at the point that uh, some people like Jonathan Haidt and Greg Lukianoff point to, you know, rapid changes in sort of generational changes in uh, the ability of people to parse information due to being basically internet natives, you know, digital natives. Or maybe you want to go back to the 1960s or to indeed the Industrial Revolution. But each of those moments in time do point to a moment at which the rate of change suddenly got even faster. And our point in the book is that the hyper novelty that we are living in now is the result of a rate of change that is actually outstripping even our human ability to niche switch. That we, we who are best at this of anyone, any life that we've ever known, like any, any life on earth, are even creating change that is too fast for us to adapt. What dilemmas do we face today that the original people of the new world could relate to? Hmm. So um, you, you mentioned the original people of the new world, and it's a place that we start in the book, right? The, the Beringians who came over uh, from Asia, from the West, and probably lived, <clears throat> probably lived on that landmass for uh, a few thousand years, actually, before um, before being forced by climate change to, to move on, you know, to stay in place and drown, uh, to head back west to the place where their ancestors had come from, uh, where presumably their ancestors, the, the descendants of their ancestors still lived and would have been none too pleased to find um, people coming back into their lands, or to head east into a place that didn't live in myth or memory at all, that had no, never seen any humans before, and that was entirely unknown. And presumably many of the people who chose that, that Eastern, Eastern route into the new world died in so, in so attempting it. Uh, but the exploration of the new world obviously resulted in thousands of cultures, um, millions of people, the in independent from the multiple evolutions in the old world of agriculture, of many languages, of the concept of zero, of architecture, of astronomy, of so many things. So what were they f facing? What were those people who were emerging into a landscape of two vast continents that had never had people on it before, but was full of, of life that is similar to what we're facing? Well, they needed to solve a lot of problems. Right? And it's those problems were not human made. Our problems are largely human made. Their problems were also not ones of running up against capacity. Right? We are running up against capacity at the population level, at the resource level. So we need to innovate now in order to figure out the solutions to our problems. But, but so did they. But the innovations were of a different sort. In a world now where everything moves so fast and everyone's looking to the future all the time. And I think to books like, and excuse my Welsh accent here, um, Yuval Noah Harari's Sapiens and all these books that are really popularized and fly off the shelves. Why do you think it, why do you think people love to look back? Oh, I, I'm so thrilled that people do look back. You know, I, I, um, I think 
there's there is a lot said now about the loss of history and usually when people say be, that you know students aren't being taught history um, and I, you know I know less about what is what happens in in the UK educational system but I think it is it is increasingly popular to bemoan the fact um, that history is no longer taught the way it used to be and this is true but history is defined as basically that moment from which we started recording our own experiences. And so obviously the vast majority of what humans have been, if you, know, if you, if you go back to the origin of life on earth, 3.5 billion years ago, the part of that that is recorded history is a tiny blip. But even the part of history, of, of prehistory, if you will, that's not recorded by humans, um, that includes anatomically and physiologically modern humans, which is give or take 200,000 years, that part of history that is recorded is, you know, 1% of that, basically, just a tiny bit more than 1% of that. So, of course, there is something to be learned from going farther back. And, uh, and also those things that have been true for the longest and have not changed, are most likely to continue to serve us in the future. And the better we understand them, the, the more productive and powerful in a good way we should be able to be going forward. It's interesting you say that because I studied history at university and I feel like all we covered was the last 60 years. <laughs> there it is, yeah. And I mean, I'm wondering what, um, you know, was it framed that way? Did you know that's what you were setting yourself up for when you, when you signed up to study history? <sighs> In a way, because when I was at high school, th that was what it was framed around. I think British universities, they sort of romanticize over World War II more than anything, to be honest. And I think if you sign up for a history degree, you're pretty much doing a de degree in the First and Second World War. Yeah. And it's, you know, I, I get it at one level, mm. but uh, it's, it's hardly everything that we are. Just, you know, just as the hunter-gatherers on the African savanna are hardly anything that we are, you know, everything that we are. Those are pieces. And, um, you know, the World War II is incredibly salient. And, you know, it too is even disappearing from collective memory at a, at a remarkable rate. But without the framing of the sort of the, you know, the expanding lens of history that, um, you know, we have these nested sets and, Yes, right now, this very moment that you and I are talking, it'll, you know, it'll be a later moment when this airs. It's, you know, it's, it's a different moment in history yet, but, but it's, it's all relevant. And the more places that we can focus with a sort of a unifying lens that says, okay, what does it mean and what should we do about it? I think the better off we'll be. Yeah. I, I mean, I get a lot of em empowerment from looking back now and, I was speaking to uh, an astrophysicist a few weeks ago on this podcast, and we were talking about the night sky and how when we look up at the night sky, it's the same night sky that Shakespeare would have looked up at. And, you know, all these great people throughout history, and it almost it made me feel more connected to these great people from the past and in, inspired me to go forward. So in that way, I, I take a lot from looking back at the past. Oh, I mean, that's, that, that's exactly right. And in fact... Um... I think, you know, I, I don't remember all of the things that we took out of the book. You know, it's, it's, a, it's an expansive book, but I believe it's still in there. Maybe in the sleep chapter, we say specifically, you know, with regard to it as a societal level, we should be seeking to keep our night sky dark mm. because that is a collective good that has value for the kind of philosophical and metaphorical reasons that you're talking about right there, historical reasons. And presumably, you know, one of the messages of the book is, we mess with the things that work at our peril because we don't necessarily know what the benefits are, right? We mm -hmm. don't necessarily know what all the night sky, being able to gaze up at the night sky offers us. Um, you know, I'm reminded when I was a child, I, I grew up in LA and I grew up about a mile, mile and a half from the Pacific Ocean. And once I was old enough, you know, this would have been in the late 70s, 80s, once I was eight or nine, I was allowed to walk down um, to the ocean by myself and just being able to sit in the sand and gaze out at the Pacific, mm. which seemed endless and uh, imagining what, what people lived on the far side of that and also seeing how small this made me and the people I knew and all of the concerns that I had. And so I think, you know, the night sky 
offers us both the time and the space perspective. If you recognize mm-hmm. that you're looking back in time as well, when, when you look at those stars. And so, you know, and it's an historical and prehistorical and, you know, evolutionary approach to understanding who we are gives you, gives you both of those things too. And then thinking about, for instance, the Beringians coming into the new world offers you, offers you the spatial perspective. Yeah, absolutely. Beautifully put. So let's get back on that track then. In what ways are our ancient bodies out of sync with the modern world as you talk about in the book? Mm. Well, this, many, many people now talk about this. And one of the things I am grateful for is how, how increasingly it seems there is some sense of evolutionary awakening in medicine. But we, for instance, um, that, you know, this, one of the stories that we talk about in the book is of the human appendix. The appendix is not unique to humans. Uh, it shows up, it, it has evolved a few times across mammals. It looks a little bit different in the various places that it looks. But uh, what most moderns, what most you know, weird, acronym weird, Western educated, industrialized, rich democratic uh, people have on their heads when you say the appendix is, ah, yeah, my cousin had appendicitis, had to have it out, could have killed him. Right, you know, it's it's that sort of story, and the other word that will tend to come to mind is isn't that vestigial, right? And this concept of vestigial is at very least an a evolutionary concept, if not an actually anti evolutionary concept. The reason being, here's this here's this organ, which most of us know some story, at least you know at least two degrees of freedom removed, but, or, or two degrees of separation removed, but maybe even closer than that, maybe even ourselves, who've had a run-in with our own appendix that could have killed us, but for modern interventions. And if it's that costly, and humans have been in you know, our modern state for 200,000 years, more or less, how is it possible um, that it doesn't also provide some benefit? How is it possible that selection simply didn't bother to, to deal with this thing that is causing so much chaos in modern times. And, you know, the fact is, of course, as with all of these questions, when, when you dig in, and, and we, we don't know where to dig for a lot of them yet, but uh, in the case of the appendix, uh, the answer is, it seems, uh, and this is, you know, there's still active research going on in this, but the, the hypothesis is that what the appendix is actually is a repository for good gut bacteria. And that in an era as, as we live in, in a time and space that weird people live in, where our food is super clean, super hygienic, and in fact, too clean, too hygienic, uh, we have very, very few bouts of GI distress, of diarrhea. And that is new. That is a modern situation. Whereas in parts of the world where diarrhea is still uh, fairly common, which is true in much of the developing world, what happens is um, that you know that is an adaptive response to you getting something in your gut that you that you shouldn't have. That is your body evacuating your gut. But as we as we now know, the gut microbiome is abundant and is necessary to a, a healthy life. So what happens after a bout of diarrhea? Your appendix is basically a source population of gut bacteria and repopulates the gut. So in a situation where your food is, has not been basically pasteurized and homogenized into sterility, uh, the appendix gives you your gut bacteria back after every time you have a run-in with, with, um, with any bad bacteria. In a situation where you rarely have those run-ins, your appendix basically doesn't get used and it will tend to do what we hear about, which is um, become, become inflamed and sometimes burst. And so we have created a problem by virtue of some of the modern solutions, many of which are good, right? Like we live longer, safer lives because we have, we have fewer run-ins with bad gut bacteria that would have killed us. But what that means is that there are unintended consequences and uh, the appendix being something that bursts on weird people and doesn't tend to burst on people who live in places where they're also having lots of run-ins with diarrhea is, is proof of this, right? You know, the appendix is not across all of humanity a problem. It's only a problem for those of us who live in pretty sterile environments. Whilst we're on the subject of the microbiome and food, um, one of the most debated topics that we talk about on here we we interview with a a lot of doctors uh, we talk about diet 
we um i like to go through both ends of the spectrum and and get ideas from everybody um you know i i've spoken to the doctors and authors who they preach the vegan approach i've spoken to those who preach the opposite um and there was a one episode i put out not too long back with um dr uh, ben bickman um researcher into insulin resistance and he was talking about why he uh, or the fact that he detests the the vegan approach and he would never go near it um resulted in me getting some very angry emails um from the vegan community even though i did not comment on it um so i wonder how your study of human history has affected your approach to diet yeah um we ask at the very beginning of the chapter on food what is the best human diet because that does seem to be the question that uh when people think about diet is at least just below the surface, if not explicit, there's mm. this idea that there must be some best, there must be some stable static best. And um, if we could just figure it out, maybe it's Mediterranean, maybe it's paleo, maybe it's grapefruit, right? Like, you know, like there are all of these diets out there, some of them patently crazy, some of them not, and mustn't there be a best one? And the answer that we give, which again is, is based in this evolutionary approach to what humans are, is there can't be a best. There can't be a best that is universal across time and space for all individuals. Think about the, just, you know, just to make it as easy as possible, think about the difference between an Inuit and a Maasai. Uh, an Inuit who is, has spent you know, thousands of years developing, evolving, and then his entire life growing up in an environment in which there's just no plant material available. And most of his diet is going to be high fat. I mean, basically all of his diet is going to be fat and meat. And compare that to a, a Maasai uh, who may be drinking the, the blood of some animals and, but, and, and also hunting, but also eating a tremendous amount of of vegetable matter uh, in the form of not just gathered uh, roots, but also some uh, leaves and seeds and berries. And so, you know, the closer to the equator you are um, as a pre-industrial human, the more likely your diet had a high preponderance of, of plant matter. And the farther from the equator you are, the lower the likelihood that your diet had a high preponderance of that. And of course, we have adapted to those situations. So. If you, tell, if you tell an Inuit that the best human diet is a Mediterranean diet, that's just not going to work very well for them. They're also not going to recognize the food particularly. Similarly, if, um, if you advocate to someone who lives at the equator that the paleo diet, well, this is, you know, this is closer to how you used to live. This, you know, this is how you should live. That's, that's absurd. Uh, and you really, I mean, I think it, you know, the paleo diet works for some, but I would argue, and in fact, Brett and I do argue in the book, that it's misnamed. You know, it's, it's, it argues by its very name that this is how humans used to be. Just like the idea that um, the hunter-gatherers of the African savanna were the, the sort of epitome of what humans used to be. Yeah, we did, we did experience that and we did live that way, but the vast majority of us have been agriculturalists for 10 or 12,000 years. And there have been changes, not just culturally, but actually anatomically, physiologically, genetically since then that have accommodated our agriculturalist lifestyles. So, you know, are we adapted to eat meat? Yeah. Are we adapted to eat veg, plant matter? Also, yes. Are we adapted to cook our food as opposed to eat it raw? Yes. Can we eat it raw? Sure. But it'll take us a lot longer to process it and we'll get less out of it. So you know, what's the best diet for humans? There are definitely a lot of bad diets. Mm. Like we can get there easily. We can, we can point to all sorts of bad diets and, you know, to borrow from Michael Pollan, most of the stuff in the middle of the supermarket is not very good for you. Right. But the, you know, there's a ton of variety in what we can eat and be healthy. And frankly, it's going to differ for me and for you because we're different sexes and it's di going to differ for you now and you in 40 years, just because you're aging. And you know, all of these things are true and they point out, I think, the value of an evolutionary approach and the naivete of imagining, I just, want, I just want to know the answer. I just want to know what's the best thing to do for everyone and apply it to everyone and stick it on everyone and be done thinking about it. It's like, well, sorry, that's not how evolution works. <laughs>
You mentioned the uh, age and uh, it's interesting. One of the one of the topics that does the best uh, whenever we do interviews on it is longevity, anti-aging. Um, I think when we first started, I think it was like in our first 40 episodes, we did an episode with Dr. David Sinclair. Um, and that was the first time we ever broke into the, the, the iTunes uh, top 10 chart. Like, is it quite a lot of interest around anti-aging? People always ask to hear about it. Um, those episodes always do well, but is it a, is it a, I don't want to say pointless, but is it futile to stress so much about anti-aging when it's going to happen sometime? Yeah. Um, so you should definitely have Brett back to talk about, um, some of the, the senescence work that he has done. Mm. Um, but we sh we can and should be living more youthful lives for longer mm. than our ancestors did. But the quest to extend maximum human lifespan is almost certain to be futile. And so, uh, you know, do you, do you really want to try to engage in a futile uh, quest um, and not slow the rate at which you become decrepit? You know, I don't, 120 year old people aren't that capable of much anymore and if they if it was possible which again it's not going to be to extend lifespan by 80 years beyond that but the rate of decrepitude would continue to what end like what what value is there in that so compare that instead to you know some of the sort of the pop psych you know 40 is the new 50 and you know <laughs> 30 is the new 40, these sorts of, or I guess I have that backwards, don't I? 50 is the new 40, <laughs> right? Um, like, okay, that, that makes some sense. If we live lives in which we are pushing ourselves where we need to and eating food that is, um, that is providing us the nutrition we need without toxifying us in ways that perhaps some of the earlier food has, mm -hmm. we can live more vibrant lives with more capacity for longer, but we're not going to get past 120. That's not going to happen. 130, I guess, is the, maybe the max that, that anyone has perhaps gotten to. Mm. You mentioned uh, sleep briefly. I'd love to touch on this. Does it do us any good to dwell on dreams? Do they really have a meaning? Can they help us better understand ourselves at all? Or is that just another futile exercise? Oh, it's, dreams, are, dreams are fabulously important. Mm. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so we, we introduce in the book, you know, we, ha we have a chapter on sleep, and we introduce in the book a model of, um, and this is going to sound far afield, but um, a, a model of what schizophrenia is, uh, right? That it is, in fact, the dream state breaking into the, the waking state. And, uh, in fact, tell a story uh, of, of me waking up in the middle of the night next to, to Brett, because uh, we not only wrote this book together, but are married, and demanding of him whether or not he's going to move the car parts from the yeah. bed. And, you know, of course, he had not, in fact, stored any car parts in the bed, because that's not a sane thing to do. Um, but uh, I was the one who seemed insane at the time. And what I was was sleep talking, of course, and I was in the middle of some narrative that made perfect sense to me, and there was no way of engaging him with the narrative, although I seemed to be engaging him. So I was I was in the middle of a dream, and I'd broken out of it into sleep talking. And that does, that you know, all of the descriptions of, of schizophrenics seem to be a lot like what we're doing when we're dreaming, and it's even more obviously manifest when someone does actually break out of the dream state and lose a little bit of the paralysis that is usually accompanying sleep and become a sleep talker or even a sleepwalker. So, you know, our dreams are, are dreams are a considerable portion of most of our most of our lives right like even if even if we're people who don't remember them and most people at least go through phases where they say i just don't remember any of my dreams i don't even know i'm having them right but sleep researchers know that we're having them mm. sleep researchers are confident that we are having the dreams all the time and they are they are the moments of, of learning, of unconscious learning, of learning without the breaks of consciousness and of, oh, I'm not going to do that because sorts of analyses, <clears throat> excuse me, there are times to experiment, to try out things that would never make sense in real life. And, you know, we've all had this experience, right, of, of working on something, be it physical or analytical or even mental, you know, psychological, like a social problem or learning to 
you know, rock climb or ride a bike or play the piano or a social problem that we're having with a loved one or a coworker. If you go to bed and you wake up and there's a solution and you didn't think you were working on it, but you were, your dream state was working on it. So, you know, as for whether the narratives can, uh, the, the particular narratives that we wake up with sometimes and try to share with people and they're incoherent and it's very hard to make sense of them, mm-hmm. whether or not you can do it at that level, I don't know. But are they, are they instructive? Of course they are. Absolutely. One thing I'd love to ask you about, um, I, we had a guest on called Neil Oliver um, quite a while back now. And he wrote a book called Wisdom of the Ancients. One of my favorite books of of last year is this book. It just, it goes through, I think it's 12 stories from, you know, human history and beyond and, and, and how we can relate them to today. I'm not sure if some of the stories may be sensationalized. You may, may, you may be able to uh, have a better judge of that than me, but I love it nonetheless. And there was one story in there, um, we're going back in the end, I thought it was, I think it was a 50,000 year old funeral um, that they found um, uh, evidence of. And it was, uh, the the funeral was for someone with, I think it was one arm, no use of their legs. So they would have served no purpose um, to a group in terms of surviving. Yet they had this almost mourning process for them. Um, the argument being that that tells us that things like love and grief are embedded in our human nature. Is that something you'd agree with? Oh, absolutely. Absolutely. Um, yeah, it should come as no surprise, uh, that Neanderthals were grieving their dead and that they indeed were grieving dead who would not appear to have had full functionality, Mm -hmm. right? That, um, and I guess maybe I'll, maybe I'll go take it this way. Um, you know, food is about sustenance, right? You observe a monarch butterfly on milkweed and it is getting substance. It is getting sustenance. It is getting nutrition only from that milkweed. It's not taking in cultural meaning from the plant um, that it is eating, right? Um, Certainly food is still sustenance for us, but it's also more, right? And the same thing with, with sex. Sex is about making more of us. Sex is about making babies. And when monarchs mate, that's, that's what it is. And they're not also um, deriving connection from, uh, from the mating um, that is going to be lasting. But for us, as for many other species, it's about so much more than that. It's about the bonding. Uh, and the, the same thing can apply and does apply across all of these domains. We are... Um, we grieve, again, as do many of these other species, like elephants and dolphins and, and other apes. And it is a way of revealing the depth of connection that we had to someone else and of reinforcing some of their value to us. And, you know, this is, this is what ghosts are, right? Like, you know, when, we, when people see, after someone you love dies, especially if you actually lived close to them. When someone you love dies and you lived, you know, half a continent away or, or you know, half a country away, um, you're less likely to see a ghost. You're less likely to be walking down the street and say, oh, wait, was that, was that him? I don't think so. Because he wasn't already in your life a lot um, on a daily basis. But when someone dies whom you really were seeing a lot, your brain does play these tricks on you. And you see the person when they couldn't possibly be there. And that is a reframing, a, um, you know, unfortunately, this is, this is part of what grief is, is like, it's, it's a reformatting of your brain. Oh, actually, that can't be him. He's gone, right? That's not going to happen anymore. Um, but, uh, but let us remind you, let, let, let the brain remind you of what the value was of, you know, if that had been him, what might've happened next? Like what, you know, what things did you get from this relationship? And, um, and how can he live on in your memories? So yeah, you know, grief, connection, funerals, these are, these are all absolutely human manifestations of the connections that we have that again, aren't most, you know, the origin of them isn't, doesn't start with humans, um, but we manifest them more completely, more uh, elaborately, let's say, than any other species out there. Mm-hmm. 
So another topic I'd love to, to touch on from a conversation I had recently with uh, Darren O'Lean from the Netflix documentary Down to Earth with Zac Efron. Um, he's a, you know, a very, uh, I don't want to use the word hippie, but a very spiritual, nature-loving guy. And he was telling me how much he gets on a human level from being outdoors. He spends a lot of his time outdoors. Does spending time out in nature have an effect on our bodies and mind in a positive way can it actually do anything for us on that human level yes i mean maybe i should just stop there because i'll go <laughs> on forever um absolutely a hundred percent and indeed um our tendency to remain in the comfort of our climate controlled right angled uh buildings is is part of what's making us sick both physically and mentally. Um, I mean, indeed, even, even at the level of, you know, this pandemic that we're still living through 18 months on, this is a virus that doesn't transmit outside, right? This is a virus that basically doesn't get people sick if, if they're running into each other outside. And if you're outside and you are sick, you are probably going to be less sick. You're going to have lo lower symptoms. At least that is true for many respiratory viruses that, um, that patients who spend, who are actually recovering as, you know, outside as opposed to inside hospitals actually do better. So, so why? Okay, so, you know, science has some answers to why being outdoors is actually better for you just, just at a physical health level. Um, and it has to do with things like airflow and boundary layers and sunlight helping um, generate vitamin D, which has a, all, all manner of health, positive health effects. And that's all true. And it's reductionist, but you know, we go after reductionism a lot in this book, but it's reductionist in a way that is true and accurate. And yet it doesn't get to the whole thing because when you go outside, you're getting a lot more than that, right? You're getting a lot more than the health benefits. If you're going outside in the city, you're running into people, you're seeing people, you're having exposure to people that you maybe have never seen before. And you have the opportunity for new connections to learn from them, even if you don't connect. And if you're going outside, not in the city, then you're out among nature and you're going to be interacting with the sounds and the smells and depending on how adventurous you are, the tastes and the touches of, of things that um, will bring you back to an earlier state and about which you have a long evolutionary history, uh, which can't be said of being effectively trapped indoors with highly sterile, planed surfaces all day long. There was a part in the book that gave me a good chuckle I really appreciate it. it was your roadrunner analogy in that Wiley Coyote often finds himself skidding off the cliff and that gravity doesn't apply to him until he recognizes that it should. And you point out that a lot of people today imagine that by changing uh, other people's opinions on, on perspectives that they change the, the underlying reality. That's right. Where do these people, what can we attribute to the rise of postmodernism? Yeah. Yeah, I, I grew up with Roadrunner and Wile E. Coyote cartoons, and I, rem I, just, I used to watch them with my dad, and it never occurred to me that it was you know, anti-physics, that it was, it was humor being used to go to fact in an era, you know, again, this would have been late 70s, early 80s, um, when pretty much no one misunderstood that this was actually not a possibility that you didn't need to be aware of gravity for it to apply. So what happened? Like what changed? Uh, a number of things changed. First of all, this was, you know, postmodernism was this just niche, niche academic discipline in the, in the 80s, in the 70s and 80s. Um, I ran into it in college in the late 80s, early 90s. And uh, it seemed absurd I pushed back against it then. Brett ran into it in college. He pushed back against it then. By the time we were in college, we were actually together and you know, we were pushing back against it together. And it what I did not, what neither of us foresaw was that it would kind of go underground for a while. And basically those peers of ours who rather than pushing back against it in the late eighties, early nineties in college, um, but who instead embraced it would become a later generation of college professors. 
in fields that didn't yet exist at the time, you know, the, the so-called grievance studies fields, you know, fill in the blank studies. And they would begin pushing a model of reality that, you know, postmodernism at its base, at its core, has some important, uh, important observations. You know, the, the idea that um, we can change some things about our reality with social influence and that um, there are similarities in how, um, how some institutions operate as between, for instance, schools and prisons. Um, this was, you know, this is Foucault's observation, um, are, are really important. But at the point that it becomes overgeneralized, uh, it becomes, frankly, a potential weapon. And so add, add to the fact that by the, probably by the sort of early mid-aughts, there began to be professors who they didn't begin to be professors. There became more and more professors and more and more fields with more and more power and more and more institutions of higher ed who believed a sort of unfalsifiable version of the universe that has no explanatory power. Add to that parenting styles that were on the uptick that were um, protected children entirely from risk so that a lot of people going to college had never been exposed to real risk. Add to that um, in the 90, beginning in the 90s, children were being prescribed absurd levels of basically psychotropic medicines, uh, often anti-anxiety and anti-depression meds for the girls and um, basically speed for the boys. And the fact that school isn't really designed for any human children, but especially not for boys, meant that you know boys were like medicated into submission and girls were medicated out of their anxiety, but into other kinds of anxiety. And then of course screens, you know, screens showed up and even, even not focusing on what's on them, but having people interact largely through screens as opposed to in person with all of the sensory human stuff that happens in person that can't happen through a screen. And you've kind of got a perfect storm. And uh, you know, the, the postmodernism got a grip on people because they'd already not been fully embodied. You know, they'd been protected from rest, they've been protected from their own physicality, and they've been living through screens, and they've been drugged into submission, and this is at one level a caricature, and at another level, unfortunately, not. And I, you know, I say that as you know, Brett and I taught undergraduates for 15 years, and just by chance, we were teaching millennials from the very, from beginning to end. We basically taught the generation of, of millennials, and, and God, we loved our students. They were fabulous, and um, they were almost to a person reachable. Many of them walked in reachable and some of them had been drugged into submission or had been protected from all risk and pain by their parents or, you know, had been living behind screens and, and were kind of scared to come out from behind them. But um, pretty much everyone was looking for a reality check and a way to find meaning and connection. And I think we all are, right? I think we all are doing that. And so, um, I am both speaking about a moment in time that would seem to point the finger at a generation, but I also feel utterly confident that given the right environment and given the right, um, given the right prospects and inputs, um, everyone can pull themselves out of even a bad developmental environment that rendered them kind of in the bodies of adults, but with the brains of people who haven't yet experienced anything. When I asked Brett this question, I think it was the first time he was on the podcast, his answer was, it's a one-way ticket to a dark world. So I'll ask you the same question. <laughs> what do you think happens to a society that negates or rejects scientific truth? Yeah, uh, uh, yeah. I, mean, <laughs> I don't always agree with Brett, um, <laughs> but I definitely, I, I, I do very often, and I certainly do in this case. Um, yeah, I have, I have quipped that... Um, you know, the, the, so Enrico Fermi, this 20th century um, uh, astronomer, observed uh, in talking with a number of other astronomers, or gosh, maybe he's not an astronomer, a physicist, can't remember exactly what his role was, but um, he and other people who were considering how we could get out into space um, began to wonder, and in fact, his question in thinking about alien life was, where are they? And so this becomes the Fermi paradox. Um, this, is, this is what it's called now. If, 
you know, if life is all that, if there are as many planets out there as we think, and as many of them as we think are capable of supporting life, and life is uh, as likely to evolve as we think, and, you know, on and on and on and on, where's all the intelligent life that we should be seeing? And, you know, there are, there are a lot of possible answers to this. And, um, and you know, some of, the, some of the possible answers are better than others, of course, but one of the answer, the answer that I have proposed half joking is a society that latches on to postmodernism instead of scientific inquiry is doomed to fail. Like there's no way that we'll reach out into the stars that we'll ever, we'll ever travel interstellarly if we actually think that believing something can change physical reality. Now, believing something can change social reality and sometimes social reality can change the inclination to act on something and having acted on something, you can change physical reality. Mm -hmm. But, you know, gravity is gravity, right? The, what, what the creators of the Wiley, Coyote, and Roadrunner cartoons had in mind, it's just not true. They knew it. Somehow, too many of us now have lost the plot. So, yeah, it's, what did, he's, what did you say, Brett said? A one-way ticket to a dark world? I, I'd have to agree with that. <laughs> if Rip Van Winkle woke up today, I think the one thing he would recognize is our education system. What is one, if you could change one thing about the education system, where would you look first? Mm. Um, one thing, wow. There's so much, I would change so much. <laughs> um, I think, I want, stu I want children to be allowed to be human rather than just be students. Mm -hmm. I, you know, you, I think maybe you heard me correct myself. You know, I, we talk about students and you know, sure, a person in a classroom is a student, but they're, they're humans first and foremost. And they're, you know, they're children if they're, if they're young. So you know, being, being forced into obeyance, into abeyance and obedience by sitting in rows and being told you can only talk when called on and that in, even in order to do you know, your bodily functions, you need to request it and, and go, go elsewhere and come back. Um, and this is all very much out of sync with what humans are. And one of the things we talk about in the book is how novel teaching is. Um, like teaching is one of the things that actually very few other species explicitly do, but not only that, um, very few other cultures explicitly teach. And that's not to say that, ev that any culture doesn't have learning. We all have learning. So, um, you know, I, I'm totally cheating with this answer, <laughs> going all over the place, but I would have an educational system in which there was more than one mode of learning possible. Uh, and I think there is a place for um, the sort of sage on the stage, the teacher now has something to deliver unto you um, mode of learning, but it is a far tinier portion of what an education should look like than most modern educational systems convey. I have two final quick questions that uh, I ask every guest that comes on the show, no matter what the topic is. The first one, we've spoken a lot today about your new book, this is obviously going to impact uh, a lot of people's lives, but I would love to turn the question to you. What books have you read in your life that have had a massive impact on you? Mm. Oh, well, I'm, I love books. Uh, so I somehow I was unprepared for the question and I'm sure I will want to add many, many to the, to the answer afterwards. Um, within and, and, so I will say also that we have a list of recommended further readings at the end of that book. And so all of those books I recommend. Mm. One of them in that list, which kind of set me off down the road of thinking evolutionarily is Richard Dawkins' Selfish Gene, which is still the classic. Um, it's, you know, it's beginning to get a little dated. It's beginning to show its age, but that's 1976. And that's amazing um, that it's still as, as up-to-date as it is. So that's in science, that's an evolution space. And I guess one other book in evolution, two other books in evolution space that I adore are Mother Nature by Sarah Blaffer Hurdy, which is effectively an exploration of kind of the human condition, but also the primate condition, mostly told from the perspective, it's a, it's a very scientific book, but mostly told from the perspective of, of females rather than the more typical um, perspective of males. 
and then um, Baboon Metaphysics, which is written by a husband and wife team, um, Cheney and Safarth, uh, which tells of their investigation of the baboons of the Okavango Delta in Botswana and their discovery of the theory of mind that baboons have and the, the ability of baboons to infer the mental states of others even when they're different from their own. So, um, you know, those, those are all in science space. I love, you know, I, I love fiction as well and read, read a lot of it um, and science fiction. But at the moment, I feel like if I say anything more, I'll, I'll be giving a short shrift to all the things I forget to say. So um, maybe I'll just leave it there for the moment. I love it. Yeah, everyone wants to to add later on when the, yeah. the answers escape them. But um, the last question I have for you today, the answer can be anything. It could be your work. It could be your wonderful family. But for you right now, for Heather, Ian, what makes a life worth living? Um, yeah, I mean, I you, you said it. It's it's those two things. It's mm. um, I am. I am blessed to live, you know, especially these last 18 months, but I am, I am blessed to, ha to share a home with three people, my husband and my two sons, my two teenage sons, whom I both love and like, and like just really enjoy spending time with them and, and our animals as well that we share our home with. And then the ability to have ideas that I can communicate clearly and put out into the world and have audience that is receptive to and interested in those ideas. That's, that's it right there. Those, those two things together. And um, that's a kind of completion and it's wonderful. Perfect. Before I let you go, please let these guys know where they can find more from yourself, where they can find the book and the podcast. Wonderful. Yeah. Well, the book, A Hunter Gatherer's Guide to the 21st Century, uh, will be out the week of uh, September 13th in both the U.S. and the U.K. and uh, available pretty much everywhere, I think. Um, and I actually have a newsletter now on Substack, naturalselections.substack.com, uh, which is, uh, I put out weekly posts. Actually, my post this, um, as we're talking, is on how we find meaning, how we make meaning in the world um, through discovery of flow. Mm -hmm. And... Um, you can find uh, Brett and me weekly doing our live streams, the Evolutionary Lens live streams at the Dark Horse podcast, available everywhere you find podcasts. And also, at least for now, on YouTube. <laughs> we won't go there. Yeah. Um, I will leave links to everything mentioned in the show notes below. Heather, thank you so much. It's been an absolute pleasure. I've thoroughly enjoyed it. And it means a lot to, to finally get to speak to you. Indeed, you too. Thank you so much.